Yeah, super helpful. Um, so my next question is, what's the purpose of the book of Deuteronomy? Like, what's like kind of like maybe like um, the message or the key themes or like what's 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 the purpose of the book? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the purpose of the book, um, I think, is it's it it is historically the the final sermon of uh, Moses before his death. He knows he's going to die. He knows he's not going to enter the promised land. They're on the edge of the promised land, overlooking it on the plains of Moab, um, Mount Nebo area, the north end of the Dead Sea. So it, it's Moses, if you like, recapitulating it, the key things and mm -hmm. in a way passing on the baton to to Joshua. Um, so, but the book, I think, um, so so the, it, it, it brings together all the themes of the, the main themes of the Pentateuch, in my opinion, the one, the one that's not quite so obvious, uh, just touched on here and there would be the creation theme, but certainly sin, Abrahamic promises, sojourn in Egypt, Exodus, wilderness, they're all there as significant themes in Deuteronomy. So Moses and law. So Moses is drawing all of those things together, but he's preaching it. So unlike, say, the law given at Sinai itself, which is this is the law, uh, sort of information explanation, Moses is, exhort is exhortation to keep the law. So it takes it a step further, more or less, mm -hmm. I, I think. Um, but also I think uh, there's a poignancy about the book because whilst entering the land will be new, they've failed before. And so that, that I think is, is, the, is a sort of critical thing about this sermon. Moses knows that they've failed. Uh, at the spies incident a generation before all those adults have now died out in the wilderness now it's the children basically he's preaching to a group of people who are with only one or two exceptions under the age of 58 mm -hmm. and um and so he's um he's he's exhorting them to in a way do what their parents didn't do most of us think we're better than our parents um but we're not really we're we're morally the same uh, in general terms and um, and so interestingly, Moses doesn't say, you, you guys, you're better than your parents. You can do what they didn't do. He doesn't say that. But actually, there's a, there's a, um, they're the same as their parents. So where they failed, they, the parents failed, they could, he could expect the children will fail. So he keeps drawing them to God, to God's faithfulness and power. And uh, that, I think, is the opening part of his sermon. Uh, so he's not just telling them what happened in the spies incident, uh, some of them weren't born then, others were up to the age of 20 then, but he's preaching that incident so that they don't make the same mistake. And um, and and as they look forward to entering into a promised land that had been promised 600 years earlier to Abraham. So it's quite a significant event, basically. I think he, he draws together, as does the Old Testament in general, and of course the New, uh, the themes of law and grace uh, so the law is premised on a relationship established by grace in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. That's an act of grace. This now how, is how you respond to me. And, and so law is in response to grace. Grace is freely given. It's the same structure of relationship in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Um, so that, that's, that's the situation. Maybe if I can just expand a little bit on... Mm -hmm on one thing I said, when um, Moses, the, the opening part of his sermon, yeah, the, this begins really at chapter one, verse six, after an introductory paragraph, uh, as he speaks to the people of Israel about the spies incident, and, and he does this over the rest of chapter one, all of two and pretty much all of three. Uh, so quite a long uh, section in a way. The, uh, why did the parents fail? And, um, the, the key answer to that is, is to do with the power and the faithfulness of God. So um, he, had, he, he recounts the fact that when the spies went into the land, the spies came back and said, these enemy in the land, they, they are tall and strong and their cities are fortified. And, um, but the people chickened out, let's say. So what happens next is Moses talks about different nations, uh, Edom, Moab, Ammon, and then uh, which Israel passes through 
and then uh, Heshbon and, and um, Bashan, where they um, they conquer them immediately before crossing the Jordan. The way that those stories are told is to show that strong, tall enemies and fortified cities are no threat to God. God is more powerful. So who do you trust? And if you trust God, then you will obey him by crossing the Jordan. Because if you don't trust God, you'd be mad to cross the Jordan. Um, but uh, so I think he's he's helping us see those sort of deep theological themes, actually, uh, that that if you trust in God, then obedience will follow. Um, Paul calls it the obedience of faith in um, Romans 1, for example. And, uh, and in Deuteronomy 1, Moses, as he recounts their fa the failure of the parents, says they rebelled, and a few verses later he said they did not trust. And the two go together in both Testaments, this sort of faith and obedience tied together. So how do you, how do you counter that as a preacher? Because I'm, a, I'm, I'm largely a preacher. I'm, I'm more of a pastoral minister in a way than an academic. But um, so, so I suppose one reason why Deuteronomy speaks deeply to me is because uh it, it tells me about preaching in particular law law that mm. must be grounded in grace and and therefore if i'm to preach for my my congregation my church to be an obedient people then what i've actually got to do uh integrated into that is actually um preach to them the powerful faithfulness of god mm. uh, God is both powerful and faithful. And if, if God's faithful but not powerful, then, well, he, he uh, ultimately at some point his faithfulness will come unstuck because he can't deliver what he promises. A bit like politicians, actually. I think politicians often make sincere promises, but they don't keep them, often because they can't, because they don't have the full control over the international affairs or the domestic affairs or even their own party sometimes. Mm. And so they make a promise but they don't keep it. Um, but God is, so So the faithfulness of God depends upon the power of God. He's more powerful than tall, strong people and fortified cities. And he's faithful to the promises to Abraham to give land. And that's what Israel is to trust in. And if they trust in him, then they will cross the land and, and obey and, and conquer a, a, a strong enemy. Mm, mm, that's really good. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Paul, in terms of like key themes to the book? Or do you think um, you've, you've summed it up well? Is there anything you want to add? Well, I think a, a famous verse in Deuteronomy, which points to a key theme, is uh, what's called the Shema, uh, which is a Hebrew word for hear, o, well, hear, uh, listen, that is. Uh, so Shema Israel, hear, O Israel. It's a term that occurs a number of times in Deuteronomy, not just once. But the famous one is chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> so hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And I think that um, uh, that that's a, a an important theme, I think, in Deuteronomy. It reminds us that, that even in the Old Testament, the laws, many of which look very superficial, you know, pick up your neighbor's animal, don't wear, you know, transvestitism for example looking after birds nests and um uh you know a whole range of sort of different things don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk mm -hmm. they look a bit sort of um you know they can look a bit tedious in a way but 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 foundational to the whole law is love the lord your god with all your heart and soul and strength mm -hmm. so we need to read the laws with sympathy in my opinion and uh, see them as good laws as psalm 19 celebrates and um, and and see them as expressions of loving God with all your heart. Related to that is all your heart. So in the ancient world, with just very rare exceptions, there was a heretic pharaoh uh, because he only believed, he was monotheistic, and they were, they thought he was a heretic. But Judaism, um, the Old Testament Israel, being monotheistic, was astonishingly rare in the ancient world, and. Um, so we, these days, Islam, as well as Judaism and Christianity, are monotheistic religions. But in the ancient world, Judaism was sort of, you know, so different. Mm. So the Egyptians had many gods. Uh, the Canaanites had gods, Babylonians and Assyrians, and everyone had lots of gods. So the temptation was always, 
oh, you've got your God, Jehovah, Yahweh, uh, however you call it, uh, or him, and, um, well, we can add him in. We can have more gods. Mm. And for Israel, the great temptation always was to just add gods um, in. So to love the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, with all your heart and soul and strength, uh, that's quite a challenge in the ancient world. Uh, that's a monotheistic challenge. Uh, and it's and and that's built on, uh, in particular, Deuteronomy 4, uh, which speaks about what other God has ever done, what this our God has done in, one, bringing people out from another nation like the Exodus, and two, speaking to them audibly on Mount Sinai in, in this case. No other God has done it. This was to show you that Yahweh alone is God. Therefore, love him with all your heart and soul and strength. So that, I think, is a, a, a pretty important theme. And it draws then into another theme that I think is critical in Deuteronomy that I touched on briefly earlier, is the place of the heart. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. I don't think we're meant to think of three separate things entirely there. I think uh, rather that, that it's a rhetorical thing. Uh, groups of three are often powerful in, in, in rhetoric, Roman Greek rhetoric as well as modern. And, um, and so to love God with all your heart uh, is, is you, you know, your inner being, your key being, your, your soul. And so it's not just about putting on a veneer of respectable obedience. How do you love the Lord your God with all your heart? What's interesting in Deuteronomy 6 it, after this Shema is it then speaks about you shall teach the laws when you go out, when you come in, when you lie down, when you get up, etc. Write them on your, your wrists, your forehead, your gate posts and above the door and all that sort of thing. I think they're just, uh, if you like, images of whatever you do in any place and any time, the law is to form who you are as a person. We mm -hmm. can't in a way really literally put something into our heart, but but the best measure we can do is to keep reflecting on the word of God uh, day and night, all the time, teaching about it to our children, teaching each other, encouraging each other. Uh, I don't think we do enough of that as Christians. And um, so getting our heart right. And that's why the climax of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, I think, is that God will circumcise your heart because in the end we can't do it. Um, so I think there are a couple more uh, crucial things, uh, I think, uh, in the book. Thank you.